You're listening to episode 17 of the Library Tech Cast, recorded on Friday, January 24th. This podcast is a proud member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Listen to other great tech podcasts at www.techpodcasts.com. This episode of the Library Tech Cast is powered by DigitalOcean. Visit librarytechcast.com forward slash DigitalOcean for more information. Welcome to episode 17 of the Library Tech Cast. We have our special guest today, Michael Schofield, with us. And uh, my name is Jeff Sable, uh, reference and instruction librarian at Concordia University and uh, all around tech guru for the library, which is not saying much. <laughs> um, I'll throw it over to my co host, Riley Childs, and he'll introduce himself. Hello, um, my name is Riley Childs. I am the IT guy and library manager and library technologies guy at Charlotte United Christian Academy. I do I manage their library and am uh, just trying to get the their library into the 21st century, and also manage the school's network um, and do all that fun stuff there. And I'm also a student there. I have a lot on my plate, but uh, our special guest, Michael Schofield. Take it away. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Hey, I'm Michael Schofield. I am uh, I'm the uh, the front end librarian at the Sherman Library in Fort Lauderdale, where it's presently 70 degrees. So <laughs> you're lucky. It's yeah. <laughs> like it's ridiculously cold here. Um, I, cold. I take every opportunity to like rub it in. You know. <laughs> so. <laughs> I'm like, oh, bird, it's 65 degrees at <laughs> 2 in the morning. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, but, yeah, I mean, uh, let's go ahead. Let's just scoot on in to our fantastic show. Um, the first thing that we want to discuss is a while back we talked about makerspaces in libraries. And the Toronto Public Library is actually starting to – have such things in libraries and I mean it's they're they're gonna get the whole 3d printer tech technology sorry that I'm turning to the left there um, and they're gonna have a maker bot and it's sounds pretty cool and I'm excited because I'm starting to uh, no did he freeze up yeah I think he did I don't know. Have you ever uh, actually used a 3D printer? <laughs> yeah, I have. Um, they uh, they're really cool, um, and I I like I, I'm I'm very much behind their um, I guess uh, the reason for being, um, especially in libraries, that they're you know migrating us away from this uh, repository commodity-based institution to a place where the community can come in and create. I like that. The 3D printers I use aren't, you know, aren't, weren't too hardcore. Like we could, um, like we made uh, plastic whistles and, and stuff out of it, but, um, <laughs> but they're getting better and, um, and it's been a while. And, uh, and you can make everything. I really like the idea that um, on, the, on the article that we were reading or that's, that it's linked to, um, it suggests um, use for if you come in because you've like broken or you lost your uh, your iPhone case or like the back of a remote um, things like this that you you know in the past that you just uh, have to deal with or I'm thinking especially about the remote you know you might like tape it up to keep the batteries in there um, yeah yeah there was there was a put there put their attention um, I, I don't think I don't think there's been a library example so far there hasn't been many I don't think there's been um, an example where a library has gotten a makerspace and they regret it. Um, right, so, yeah. You know, um, and uh, I think that's a really good rate of uh, of review, you know. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, and you hear so many success, success stories of people, you know, creating, uh, like, art installations and stuff like that. Yeah. And, I mean, it's it's pretty amazing to see what, what different people they draw besides, you know, the the, the I guess, typical library user. Who's, who's basically there to get, you know, check out their books and go home. Right. Welcome back. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> um, I have what is arguably called the best school-issued laptop, but it overheats. Bad. Bummer. And it turns off. Sorry. 
Um, yeah, so do you have anything to add, Riley, about we were just talking about maker spaces in general and and sort of how, you know, that's uh, going to be a, a component of the future of, of libraries. Um, and Michael was saying how not one has really a library was regretted it or, or opened a maker space and where it failed miserably, where it didn't engage, I guess, the community. I honestly don't ever, I mean, the only, the only pro, the only thing that I could see where a maker space could hurt a library if they don't try it. Cause I mean, worst case scenario, it doesn't work. I mean, uh, the program might cost a little pricey, maybe $10,000, but I mean, to get started and maybe not even that I mean it depends on where you get going try getting some cheap LEDs and some stuff in a solder iron from Radio Shack teach some people how to solder I mean spend a hundred bucks there see if people sure. are interested can't hurt so Absolutely. yeah yeah um, yes so moving on the next uh, the iPads more LA yeah. iPad news though those um, so the committee, the oversight, com I'm, I'm sorry, um, so the oversight committee that is over this thing, they've disbanded. And the reasoning for this is that it's, um, that it's redundant because the superintendent already has oversight. Um, uh, any thoughts on that? I mean, I don't see... I, I'm trying to figure out, I'm just trying to catch up, I'm trying to figure out how this is, uh... Like what this actually means. What did the what was the purpose of the watchdog committee before? Um, uh, to provide oversight, and I guess to examine it. But all out of the blue, they just disbanded it. Like I mean, it just all of a sudden went away. Um, and the reasoning that was given was because it does they they don't they feel that it's an additional layer of redundancy, which I can understand if the oversight was coming directly from the school board, which it kind of is, but their reasoning was that the oversight is coming directly from the superintendent. Um, I mean, I think, I think this is going to, I think be, that uh, this is just going to, I think there was. Some... Bad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You don't, you probably don't know this, but you're uh, like, your mic is cutting out in really oh, funny wait. ways. Did, did you go away? Ah. <laughs> uh. Yeah, it just it just like froze up. Um, all we got was that you think this is bad. Yeah. Um, I need you. <laughs> My prediction is 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 this eventually. I mean, this is basically just a stop <sighs> measure before. I'm gonna uh, switch. There's going to be some kind of investigation is my is my prediction, which was my prediction last week that it's going to come out that there was some kind of bribery or someone's going to be indicted or something. Um, just because it's just been such a miserable failure. The, the head technology officer resigned immediately once they began investigating this this debacle. And, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's just going to turn into a huge story of corruption and iPads in the classroom. So any anybody else have anything to add? Um, we can move iPad on to the next. <laughs> No, Make that's all I got. <laughs> I don't have anything to add. Yeah, so we want to move on. Uh, the RFID and libraries. Yeah, um, this is next. Just, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm just saying this is cool. I'm excited for this one. So. Yep, did he freeze up again? Riley? Yeah. Go ahead, Jeff. Oh, yeah, go, go oh. ahead. Oh, yeah, do you hear me? Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I'm gonna have to call Logitech about this. I'm not happy. Um, okay. But hopefully you can still hear me. Am I cutting out? Okay. If no, I'm not, not cutting out, you're good. Let me just kind of explain what this is all about. Okay. Cool. Back. Um, so the Rochester Public Library is in the process of putting RFID tags on all of their. Um, on all of their DVDs and CDs and that's and Blu-ray discs, discs and all that stuff, and then eventually they're going to start to move on to um, the books. And their ultimate goal is to, by the end of 2015, is to have all 430,000 books in the library available with RFID tags. And it says that the total cost of this is 
uh, two hundred about two hundred thousand dollars, which actually doesn't sound too pricey. Um, I'm not sure about either of you, but I mean, depending on the size, I mean, a public library that size that doesn't sound too bad. I mean, that's fifty cents a book. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think it's a, a huge upfront cost. I mean, where you figure you already have some kind of security system in place, but if you look at how much loss prevention, how much convenience um, that these contribute, I, I do think it's it's relatively inexpensive. If you sort of space it out, if you know, if you have zero missing books after ten years, um, it probably you know you, you make an argument that it pays for itself. Yeah, I agree. I think this is a you're right. I'm a, it's it seems pricey to to me, but um, but the um, this I this is I think this is also going to have a couple things that might be harder to measure. One, um, you're going to uh, it's part of it's an investment in the user experience, and uh, you know people think about it. A lot of people so, there, there's sometimes a rare anecdotal person who really likes to engage with the person at the counter. Um, I'm certainly not one of them. It's just like when I shop, I, if there is a self-checkout line, I will yeah, self-check out. Yeah. If I don't even have to check out, if I could just walk through a scanner, I'd, I'd much prefer it. Um, the um, the other thing is that the more secure they feel in, uh, you know, that they're that they're going to prevent loss. Um, hopefully, the the more unique things they can circulate um, you know thinking about tool libraries or um, or like hard you know hard software and stuff like or even machines um, you know I, I think it, it, you know if, if, they, if they only use it just like for their books I mean, they don't use it to take a chance and it'll be silly but um, but I think it's cool I think there's a really neat future in RFIDs um, I I don't, I don't know if I foresee this, but I'm really amused by the idea of um, at some point everything has an RFID, you no longer need cataloging or you no longer need like shelving protocols. Like you can just put something on a shelf uh -huh. um, and then you, this is, you know, far future, not, maybe not too far future, but then you, uh, <laughs> you're looking for an item and it tells you where it is and where it is in proximity to you. Um, this is something that um, Cory Doctorow, like I think first wrote about, I'm sorry, I'm sure he didn't first write about it, but in his book Makers, where they just had a bunch of tub and they had a bunch of all this stuff. Think about maker spaces and you might have, or hacker spaces, and you have all this crap. You have like random tools. You have, uh, like, how are you going to catalog like um, a casing for like a computer that's just, that you just picked up, right? Um, you can just throw it into tubs and then you could, uh, whatever you're looking for, you locate. Maybe, maybe the tub blinks blue or something to show you where it is. I think there's a lot of future, future neatness to, to this. Um, that's how I like to. That's how I prefer to think of things because right now the present isn't that interesting. But uh, um, but I mean, there's already even been programs where uh, you know, there's geolocation like within the building, within 10 feet of yeah. like RFID book. So basically, on your phone, you could look up a book and it'll direct you right there within 10 feet. So, I mean, it's not perfect yet, but I think it's getting a lot, a lot. Uh, uh, like like you said, like the future would be you you do really need uh, cataloging schemes to to catalog to you know place books on shelves when you have something that'll tell you you know if you get within a foot maybe you know then you'll it's almost impossible not to find the book. Well, one of the other things is this would also have a big impact behind the scenes um, because one of the things that I think David Singleton mentioned last week was about how rather than having the books sit in a book drop overnight. Think about if I put a book in that book drop, it's going, it could, when it hits the bottom of that book drop, it could theoretically be check, check yeah. itself in. And then that means that, um, I mean, that, that alleviates one step of the process and that allows the book to get onto the shelf faster. I know check, sliding a book under a scanner is only a couple of seconds, but multiply that by a whole bunch of books you can have that oh, entire yeah. bin of books on the shelves. See, yeah, but. it'll it'll streamline a lot of processes. And I mean, he was even talking about how if you have five books in your backpack and you have your library card on you, if there are if they are if they all have RFID, when you walk out, it'll automatically check them out to you. Yeah, right. Which I mean, you know, and that's just making the user experience more and more uh, convenient. And and I think 
I mean, in my opinion, my humble opinion, more pleasurable because you don't really have to sit in line. Well, I mean, you know, if you go to downtown LA library to LA public downtown, you're sitting in line if you're not using the self checkout. I mean, and maybe for 10, 15 minutes, just cause there's something online. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, and not only that, it's, I mean, it's just kind of, it was just kind of neat to be able to have it like a speed pass, just be able to put slot, put your card on the thing, even check your books out. And the main reason they gave in this article is that they wanted to move is for patron convenience is because sure. what was happening was is at their, at their self checks and, um, the books weren't scanning properly and the patients didn't know how to use the barcode scanner. So you might run into a situation where it does, the book doesn't get, get checked out or something like that. And that saves on lost items, like you were saying. Um, but yeah, I mean that it's just going to be interesting to see how that goes going forward. And on something that ended up and moving on, any last thoughts on that? Anyone? No. Okay. Now let's move on. Okay, move it on. Um, every something that is near and dear to the service that is near and dear to everyone's hearts, known as OverDrive, is going moving to DRM MP3s. Um, I and I, I think it's not quite. <laughs> Did I read that right? It's not yeah, quite so, DRM free. So so Boing Boing um, got really excited, and I think we all got excited. I certainly got excited because I shared it everywhere. Um, I was like, yay. Um, but basically what they're doing is they're, um, they're, they're getting away of, um, their, uh, they're getting away of like, uh, windows format phones, like the WMA files, the Zoom files, uh, things like that. I mean, they're going purely for MP3s, um, which, which, uh, some of the other people I were talking, I was talking to mentioned that, you know, wow, you know, Good for them on finally figuring out that um, these non-MP3 file formats weren't ever being used. I think that's what happened because the idea is that you oh you can sit and you can stream an audio book while you sit at your computer. That's like um that's less likely to happen than you know download it to your phone or whatever. But the DRM is still there. The DRM is not at the I guess what I'd call like the file level. The MP3 is you could you can make a local copy of it and nothing will happen. But as long as you're um, adhering to the terms of service um, the uh, and you have, like, the OverDrive client open, it will, you know, once the checkup period is over, it'll still prompt you to delete all the files. But um, it's, certainly a lot, it's certainly a lot easier to steal the files, <laughs> you know, and, and I'm sure I'll do it. Um, but... Uh, the, the basically the um the headline was uh, a lot more exciting than I think the reality is and um, Overdrive actually tweeted uh, at Boing Boing and they're like hey Boing Boing and it was like actually Overdrive still has DRM <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and and they seemed really proud of it um I'll uh, I'll hook you guys up with the actual tweet um when I uh, pull it up but um but it's it's a big like really hullabaloo about nothing. Basically, the result is they're, they're getting rid of like the WMA file format. So any of you out there using WMA file formats, sorry, too bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I mean, who's who's still using that except for like the sample videos that come with? Actually, no, those are MP4s. The sample videos that come with um, the sample sounds that come with Windows. Those are actually M MP3s. Uh, I don't know. I, cer I certainly never use it. I never have. It's, it's like those services. Oh, like open up. Uh, you can read the audio book through like Adobe. Uh, oh Adobe yeah. Adobe something. You can read it on your screen or. Who's gonna do that I though? I, I don't know. Um, I guess if you're desperate, um, or if you really like to sit <laughs> at your computer and read. But you know that's. Uh, that's I remember. I remember the early days of of this stuff when I thought I was cool and I was. I mean like. 2006 that I was sitting at my computer reading my uh, reading my algebra book or reading my uh, whatever book from Overdrive and I was like seven. <laughs> I mean, I, I do read I do read some like uh, like technical books at work that I have in like I think it's Adobe Adobe Digital Editions or something. Yeah, that, that's, um, that's what yeah. the program is here. Yeah, and I mean, I, I mean, I don't, I don't mind it really. I mean, but I mean, I'm not gonna sit there and read a novel at my computer. 
I think re- I think reading on your screen is a lot more uh, likely than listening to like an awful audiobook on your screen. If you think about yeah. like, oh, I want to pick up where I left off, you have to go to your computer to do that. Um, maybe that was true like when Overdrive first came out, but I think now, you know, we yeah. got phones that can right. do this yeah. for us. You know, right. we can walk around and do it. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, so I mean, congratulations to Overdrive for being a little less douchey, I guess. The, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's you know, it's maybe plus half a point toward the copy fight. Um, but I don't think anything's changed a whole lot. The they we still have the fact that um, yeah, they they still have the fact that each audio book you buy is considered an individual book and all that good sure. stuff there and we're going to need to work on that overdrive but you're getting there i, I um, think that I, we we could dedicate a whole show to like the vendor licenses um yeah. you know overdrive can and does let's be honest screw libraries because there really isn't competition i mean there's more of overdrive like companies coming out but um you well know, i mean they captured 99% of the market i mean a sure. public library um, and you know what? The, like the like, what's in their bag is that people, at least people at our place, um, love it. So you know, the, all the all the concerns that librarians have, and the fact that it's costing library libraries a lot of money, and there's no like first use doctrine because you don't own these, um, and so you can't, you know, you have to buy re- repurchase a license to uh, circulate over a certain amount of times. Um, Users don't really care because they're like, "Hey, I can just pull this down on my Kindle, or yay!" Um, and that's that's kind of a, a big boon in Overdrive's hands. Um, the San Rafael Library, uh, run by the who's the, the director is a uh, Sarah Houghton, the um, the librarian in black. She um, they do something cool. I, I think more libraries should do it. This is my little bit of soapbox, and I'm gonna get off. Um, they make it so that when you click. Onto Overdrive, there's a pop-up on the website that says, "Yo, you know all that." Uh, I'm sure it's not like "Yo," <laughs> but it's like, "Yo, <laughs> um, you know all that." Um, all, you know all the concern that libraries have about like your privacy and like how much we care about you. I'm sure it doesn't say that. It's basically saying like, "Hey, you're going off to a corporation site, and they're not going to protect your privacy. They're gonna like data mine this." Um, and the the circumstances that they put us in aren't all that great. You should know this before you use them, you know, and, you know, kind of like it's, it's interesting. It's just like a little uh, PSA before you go off to, you know, it's like, hey, it's like, you know what you're actually doing when you go to Walmart to buy groceries? <laughs> <You know? laughs> sure. uh, people are just going to do it. But Kind of like the federal government sites. Every time you leave, sure. like you go to whitehouse.gov, you get a little pop up that says, hey, sure you want to leave? But, uh, I, but I think the, the average uh, library patron has no idea how much Overdrive is costing or how much market share they have or, you know, how much, you know, they're screwing libraries out of, you know, the, the patron's tax money that they paid into it. Um, sure. And I, 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 yeah, I mean, I think that, I mean, it's got to it's gotta enlighten somebody to, to sort of take some sort of action or at least be educated to what, what Overdrive essentially is. Yes, and we are we are slowly and surely getting there. Um, any last comments before we? Anyone have anything else before we start to move on? Before we move on to our next topic? Uh, anything else? Are you good? Um, one more one more thing is like um, Douglas County Libraries. They went with um, Odilio TID. Uh, they partnered with them to. Um, actually purchase their own ebooks, so I, I think they're out from Overdrive. And actually, they they were saying a lot of um, times they're trying to take these books with them when when they have licenses that where they actually purchased them. And they said that actually Overdrive, um, I think they one library had some that they actually purchased, and they said that Overdrive actually gave them the ebooks to take with them oh, wow. to the new the new platform. I, I'm sure it was a small percentage, and I mean once once this uh, library district committed to it I'm sure you know they sort of knew they were going to be leaving but um, that's sort of I mean and then they're trying to base their model on where they purchased the books and they're a pretty big library district so um, they have some sort of bargaining power but they're sort of trying to break from overdrive's evil clutches I should say <laughs> mm-hmm. 
the okay the path. then. Well, um, before we move on to our flat, uh, to our other next news topic, I just kind of wanted to give a shout out to um, to DigitalOcean. They have we run on them. They're fantastic virtual private server provider. Uh, for five dollars a month, you get 512 megabytes of internet virtual cloud awesomeness. Um, and we actually have a special little deal that. Uh, we can hook you up with. If you go to librarytechcast.com forward slash DigitalOcean, sign up for an account. Um, uh, just, that just lets them know that we sent you. And then if you go slide into their cloud panel, click on billing, all the way down at the bottom, or um, it's uh, billing, manage payments. There'll be a, I'll post a little on the show notes about how to get there. Um, all the way down at the bottom, it has a space where you can put in a promo code. And that promo code you should put in is SSD2014. And that niche, that gives you $10, a $10 credit. You don't have to put in a credit card. No, it's basically no strings attached. Um, just a great way to help support us, pay for our web hosting. Um, and, and if you're if you're interested in uh, like something like an open source like Koha, that, or Koha, that's a great way to um, sort of install it and check it out. Yeah. There's actually a great guide written by yours truly on their community, um, all about how to install Koa on one of their VPSs. And I mean, you don't really have anything to lose. Just go ahead, check it out um, using our link because we get credit for that because we sent you. Um, but I mean, that would just be great to help us out. Uh, but that's enough, I guess, for now. Moving on to the uh, our final topic. HTML DRM, 5 DRM, and Michael, I'm sure you have some very interesting <laughs> comments on this. I do. Thank you. Thank you for the. Yeah. Thank you for the <laughs> no, intro. The, um... that, and I mean, and I mean, I'm, right man. <laughs> I mean, this is one of the. I'm, I mean, I'm sorry. It's just you're the one who put this in, and I mean, I was. I, I had no idea. I'm, and I'm sure like no one had any that's, idea. That's so. I've been kind of um. I've been talking about this for like the last couple of weeks, and I'm sure ad nauseum. Um, but um, but the reason that you know I drew threw it in there is precisely because that there's this vacuum. Um, librarians are especially you know I mean we have a logo, librarians against DRM. There are people who have this tattooed on them, right? Um, this is a um, this is a mantra of what librarians largely stand against. Um, and a lot of people aren't, don't realize that there's this uh, that that DRM is already in the process of coming into uh, the native browser level. So um, what happened is uh, in uh, I believe it was like October, I think it was in October 2012, um, Tim Berners-Lee, the creator of the internet, um, and the W3C, um, the standards body for um, for HTML5, and um, they what they uh, what they did is they they they, um, they proposed something called, in addition uh, uh, an extension to HTML5 called the encrypted media extension and this is at the pressure of um, uh, companies that that um, someone someone called the Holly Web it's Hollywood and the web it's I love that term but <laughs> the idea that it's like think of it like Netflix and right now when you want to stream Netflix in your browser they you have to download uh, Microsoft Silverlight, I don't even think it's Flash. Other companies that want to lock down their content are using Flash. So they go to the, they go to the W3C and they say, hey, um, we don't want to be beholden to these third-party plugins anymore. HTML5 is already um, getting away from Flash. It's, you know, uh, you, you can do what you used to be able to do in Flash. You can pretty much do with, like, CSS3 and uh, JavaScript. Um, we no longer want to have to force people to download Silverlight. We don't want to be beholden to these other companies like Adobe and Microsoft. There should be a spec in HTML5 that lets us do it. And the W3C says, they say, oh, well, why? Uh, why? Why should we? And the Hollyweb says, well, because if you don't, we are going to take our content, our streaming video, elsewhere. Well, the W3C took that bait. The what's funny is like, where are they gonna go? They're gonna leave the internet. Um, <laughs> right. The um, the they took that bait, 
I think it's bait. Like there are a lot of people who think it's a good thing. But what what the encrypted media extension does is create a native browser level JavaScript API that essentially communicates with something else. Sorry if this is getting too technical. It's called the the EME communi- is just an API that communicates with another part of software or of the spec called a CDM, uh, the Content Decryption Module. Um, and that's another that's something else that lives in your browser or on your computer. And these things talk to each other to say, hey, does uh, the EME says, hey, does this person have the right to watch this video from Netflix? And the CDM says, yes, here's the, here's the secret key. And it decrypts and you can watch your video. What's troubling, there's, there's different things that you know, I'm certainly troubled about. Um, and you guys feel free to weigh in. Um, the only way for DRM, or there's, the first thing is that the W3C is an open standards body, right? Um, there's nothing about the web that isn't open source. Um, if there were to be a new, uh, like if somewhere out there in, in high school there is a, a young Tim Berners-Lee, and he's going to want to go and create his own browser, right? Or someone who he's going to want to spin off something that's not Firefox or Chrome, something new. Um, the way the DCMA, the, Dig- the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, or in Europe, the EUCD, I'm not sure which one that stands for, um, but they make it illegal to um, to violate DRM, um, to get around DRM. So the DRM licensing bodies um, make it so that if you want... Oh, what I was trying to say is like basically... Like so, the W3C is an open standard, and there's nothing, and and the the DRM part of it is secret, necessarily secret, right? Because otherwise, other people would just get around it. Um, so the the content they don't define what this the content decryption module is. It could be anything. It could be a piece of hardware. Um, so for somebody to who wants to be innovative and they create their own browser or whatever, they're going to have to enter agreements with a DRM licensing body, is probably pay a fee or whatever, because it's illegal to otherwise without their permission, um, recreate the web to get around DRM. You can't, you can't make extensions to it. You can't change it. You can't learn about it. Um, That's stupid. Without, uh, yeah. And so there's, there's something that just like, kind of like stomps innovation. The other thing that's really disturbing, that took me a long time to say that. So the other thing that's really disturbing is that for DRM to work, you need something native on your computer that you don't know about uh, monitoring your acceptable use of the files, right? So this is something right now that's um, in the HTML5 spec that is probably, it, it might be hardware, it might be like a USB you have to plug in, but probably not. It's probably going to be software that lives in your browser and monitors your acceptable use of like the Netflix files, right? Before to monitor acceptable use of files, it has to monitor everything you do. And unlike Flash, unlike Silverlight, it's not something that you can opt out of. Um, and I, you know, I, I find that disturbing. I mean, like you can opt out of, you can say, I'm not going to use Firefox. I'm not going to use Chrome. I'm not going to use Internet Explorer. The EME is already well, active in Internet Explorer 11. So if you opt out of the internet, you can get around it. But, um, <laughs> just turn but, off your computer. Use Opera. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just, it's disturbing. And there are arguments for it. Um, because who wants third party plugins, you know, um, and other reasons. Um, but, Really, just librarians, you know, who are big proponents in the copy fight, you know, they don't, they just don't know about it, you know. So it's just uh, something they should because it's been around for a while and it's, uh, and, and, um, and yeah, I'll let you guys talk. I'm on, I'm off my soapbox now. So, so no one, so there isn't like an out. Doesn't seem like there's a campaign. I mean, you Google it and there's there's only three articles on it. The first three Google results are it. There, I mean. So the, the Electronic Frontier yeah, I mean, Foundation I, I was is in against the dark. it. Yeah, yeah, I mean the Electronic Frontier Foundation is trying to is trying to do that, or is trying to bring light to the issue. Um, HTML5 rocks, uh, which creates the HTML5 boilerplate and all that. I think. Um, anyway, they posted a really great, very technical intro to the EME, like how you would actually use it in code, um, and they and they created a Google Doc that has tons of articles, pro and con. The thing is that unless you're, I mean, unless you're a really nerdy, hardcore web guy, or you follow the EFF and everything they do, 
um, then um, then yeah, I mean it's not really anywhere else. I mean it's in the web community, but even the web community, the, like the 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 places you usually go to like learn how to do things. I don't want to like I don't want to like call anyone out, but you know there are websites that you go so you can learn how to do stuff <laughs> like like CSS and JavaScript and um and there are people who talk about really interesting things like responsive images and um and uh and these are important things for performance and and the web and they have huge audiences and largely they're not even talking about it either um and it just baffles me it seems like um the actual community of the web would be more interested so maybe it's just a fight that um no one like cares about that I've just like kind of like gotten onto my horse um yeah I mean this EFF, is yeah I mean EFF cares about it and like a few other places do but it's not it's not like well, it's and I, also, I, think, I think if you ask the average person do you want some program to monitor all your files on your computer most people would say they they would not you know I mean sure but but I, just, I, 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 mean, it, 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 I mean it has to be complete ignorance and they're trying to you know once it's in every browser then it's harder to protest yeah. it because they're not asking that. They're asking, do you want to do you want to be able to watch Netflix in your web browser without yeah. silverware? Right, right. Yeah. So what's really that. troubling, and the reason I thought about, I was, it just occurred to me one day. I was like, librarians aren't talking about this. But the other thing is that, like, so since uh, since that EME is well underway, um, the W3C is entertaining other other parties. Um, those being publishers, and we know them. They uh, oh. they came and they said like, hey, if the if the HTML5 video and audio elements elements are going to have an API to lock down content, we should be able to do this with like eBooks too, and we should be you know we should lock down that. The 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 funny thing about that is that essentially an eBook is just a website with like no pictures, right? It's just it's right. markup. It's just it's a text file. So so you're going to I mean it's possible with the JavaScript EME API. That you could lock down an entire website. Um, now the arguments that like I've when I've brought this up, the arguments are like, well, you don't have to use it. I mean, libraries certainly aren't going to lock down their websites with EME um, or or whatever. But there's going to be a lot of people that do. You know, um, Google uh, Google Chrome is certainly interested, and they don't want to. Um, I did love. Think about how you think about YouTube. I mean, this is certainly going to be. Uh, uh, a you wouldn't be able to download YouTube. YouTube. Well, you're you not be able supposed to, download to anyway, YouTube. right? And they already have like algorithmic, um, uh, I guess, uh, takedown, right? If if it detects right, that you right, have right. music or some sort of copyrighted material, it'll uh, pull your content down automatically. So you know that Google is certainly interested in this. Um, and whatever. And okay, maybe it's just like maybe it's just like video sites. And yeah, they should be able to lock down their content. And that's true, but they're not going to be able to lock down their content without monitoring everything you do on your browser. You know. And I wouldn't be opposed to having. I'm honestly, as it, as it stands for now, I'm not opposed to Microsoft Silverlight. So sure, it's another process that runs in my background, but it's only really active when the web browser is using it. Sure. I do not want something that I cannot opt out of. The th the third party plugin is totally opt in, right? So you can yeah. you can. You download it. You know what you're getting getting into. It has its own terms of service. Um, so, so yeah, I, I'm with you. I'm, I'd rather use like Flash or, or something. To, to and what does this mean for um, open source? Because you know, Cro the Chromium, Chrome, whatever it is, I don't so, know. Is never gonna the open source version of Google Chrome is never gonna be able to implement this because in theory. It's a closed door thing. It's not something that the algorithm Correct. is not something that you Correct. can Correct. So there's open another source. there's another open source browser called Firefox, right? They're they're part they're yeah. they're really t um they're really into the free open source software movement and fundamentally like the DRM it one like it doesn't Fire mesh. Firefox has already like said that they're going to do this. Um Mozilla is back on it and 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 the reason I made that whole spill at the beginning is because their exact reasoning was like, well, if we don't, if we don't do this, and people lose Netflix or whatever, we're going to we're going to lose a large market share to another browser. And okay, um, but that I agree that completely undermines open source because not only is it something that's secret about the code about how it's implemented, right? Um, but it's also um, it also kind of invalidates what you can do with the open source code because, like I said, like it is illegal. 
and the DMCA and the EUCD, it is illegal to modify, tamper with, or do anything or disable DRM. And you and if you have an open source browser where DRM is a, a very fundamental part of its multimedia experience, you can't do anything without 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 licensing agreements, right? Without without getting into without at least signing a paper, which I'm sure someone's going to force you to pay for. Um, well, it makes it not open source. Yeah, well, there's like people have opened. Uh, it looks like there's a few tickets open on the on the Mozilla bug track. On yeah. The Mozilla <laughs> track, and then all of them have all the comments in them have come down to the point where it's basically saying, "I don't want this. It's DRM." Right. Right. Yeah, and I um, mean, it's like if the community is telling you not to do it. And I understand about relevance, but Firefox is such a big browser that it's like, because I mean, at this point, it's like Google Chrome has 33%, Internet Explorer is 30, has more than that, and then Firefox has a big chunk as well. Firefox is still a big browser, and they don't want to alienate that, and um, and the content providers wouldn't want to alienate if Firefox doesn't do it, I think that there's hope that the content, it's really, it's going to be there, but no one's really ever going to use it. And I think there's hope for that. I, I think, I guess I'm more cynical. Um, I don't, yeah. like, like, I think about the OverDrive thing, right? Um, I use OverDrive a lot. I'm a librarian. I hate DRM. But I also don't like reading, like, physical books that other people touched, right? So, um... So the um, so the, the fact that OverDrive is like screwing the li like the li like a library or whatever, when it comes to the point where I'm a consumer, I don't care. Like if I want to like watch a video with um with my three year old on Netflix or something, like I'm not I'm I'm going to do that in a browser that supports it, right? I also think that um. Um, once this, once, once this EME, once the API is implemented or wh wh whatever flavor um, comes the final version, um, I think you're going to see it everywhere. I think, um, I think they're going to lock down audio. They're going to, like for instance, like uh, you do the library techcast podcast, and maybe you might um, let people download the MP3 file by itself. Um, there's going to be podcasts that lock that down, so you have to subscribe through iTunes, or, or there's going to be all sorts of reasons to lock down content from access point A to force people through access point B. Um, there was a great um, uh, code example on, a, on CodePen, which just tried to mimic what copyright or what the EME might be, poten like potential might be, and it was just, it was just illustrating what, what the web might be like if you couldn't highlight text and copy, and cop, um, and copy it, right? Um, yeah. And you can, you can shut that down with like JavaScript and like CSS right now, but it's, um, but think about it. It changes what the web is, you know. So I don't know. Ars Technica actually has a very is a very in depth article on it about yes. how, yeah. Um, and what they're saying is that EME isn't the actual DRM. EME is rather the what talks to it. Yeah. What talks to it. So theoretically, you could implement this as an open standard, but the DRM is totally on the end of the content provider, so that's that's the point. That's the CDM. That's the content. De, that's the content decryption ah. module. So, and they said because they leave it unspecified. I mean, there's not a lot about it in the spec. It could. I mean, we're assuming it could be software that monitors. It's very likely it could be a piece of hardware. Like you have to go to the store and get like a Netflix. Uh, kind of like stub. HDCP. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like you had to have a. Like I, even you still do. Like I couldn't play. I couldn't take an H. I couldn't run a DVI cable to any old monitor. It had to be HTCP compliant. For sure. Uh, it's, yeah. So it no, but I mean, like any that. any chance that a company has to make money, especially with uh, you know the music industry losing money in such a substantial way, I mean they're gonna they're gonna fully exploit any technology that allows them to make more money. Yeah, <laughs> and I mean. Honestly, at the end of the day, there are still going to be rule breakers, and I mean, I, I, the the big point about the EFF and like I guess I, I'm I'm sure all of us can speak to it, um, is that when has DRM ever stopped you from copying something you wanted to copy, right? Um, right. Like how many audiobooks? I'm you know I'm outing myself. Uh, how many audiobooks have I downloaded from OverDrive that are still on my computer? Um, 
the um the my big thing is that if that this is this could also be like a, a floodgate opening. So you enter one aspect into the W three C HTML five spec that is not open. Um, there will be more, you know. Um, so I mean, it's just uh, you're handing the you're handing the reins of control over to you know, like the the W three C has been a good um, shepherd for essentially like the you know uh, the openness of the web. And I think they're giving it away. You know, I think they're giving a part of that away. Um, so, you know, it's it's a big deal, and there just should be a conversation about it, and there just isn't one, you know? And, it, yeah, and it's and like you said, it's it's the foot in the door at the, at the HTML spec. It, there, it's just this one thing, but who knows? Maybe in a year, there's this great, we could do this, or we could sure. do this. And before you know it, to get... Um, HTML is back to where it was in 1995 with Microsoft versus Netscape and the Internet Explorer bundling. Um, and it's not going to be good. Not going to be fun. Yeah. <laughs> All, right, anyone, All right, let's wrap it up. Yeah, anyone have anything they just want to plug really quickly before we and go into our slow descent, uh, rather, or rather a quick descent? Um, <laughs> into the end. Michael, where can people find you on the um, interwebs? Yeah, they can find me at uh, nsforlib.com. Um, they just Google front-end library, and they Google the web and libraries. I'm pretty sure I'll pop up, because that's just my stick. So. <laughs> okay, and uh, Jeff, where can people find I'm you? On, uh, I'm on Twitter at uh, LA Library Man, um, and you can, you know, I'm on the show every week. <laughs> awesome. And, and you can find me on the internet. I'm RileyChilds.net. You can find all my social media stuff there. And I tweet a lot. I'm at Rowdy Children. Um, uh, and yeah, I mean, and where can you find the Library Tech Cast? Well, you can find us on the, on the Twitter thing. We're at Library Tech Cast. Facebook.com forward slash Library Tech Cast. And of course, YouTube, youtube.com forward slash library tech cast. And I've, and all those wikiers things, people out there, if you're, if you would like to help us with our show notes, um, come check out the wiki, wiki.librarytechcast.com, um, because I am not a very, very good at keeping track of this stuff. So I'm going to give that my best shot this week, but just kind of help us out, wiki.librarytechcast.com. Um, but for the Library Tech Cast, I'm Riley Child. I'm Jeff He's Sable. Jeffrey Sable. <laughs> and have a nice week. You just listened to another fantastic episode of the Library Tech Cast. Did you know that you can watch us record the show live every week at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time on Fridays at librarytechcast.com forward slash live. You can now find us on Stitcher Radio. You can download the app from the app store of your choice. You can also find us on iTunes. Just search for Library Tech Cast. You can now follow us on Twitter. We're at Library Tech Cast. You can also follow us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash Library Tech Cast. Our YouTube channel is youtube.com forward slash Library Tech Cast. Any views voiced by the hosts are their own and not representative of any organizations or associations they may be affiliated with.